John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The precise word order of the Greek text actually says, And God was the Word, rather than the Word was God. It is hard to imagine that the use of the word God, appearing twice in John 1.1, 1, 1, would be a different God person from the only true God the Father himself. There are two scripturally sound explanations to show how God's word, the Logos in John 1.1, 1, 1, can be called God himself, which I believe are both true. Firstly, God the Father spoke of His Son as God before the Son literally existed as a Son. Because Romans 4.17 says that God calls the things which be not as though they already were. We know that the Scriptures state that God expressed His divine plan for the human ages before human time began. Isaiah 41.4 states, that God called forth the generations from the beginning. Literally, all human generations of all human history were called forth by God in His expressed thought from the very beginning. This is precisely the meaning of the Greek word logos in John 1.1. 1, 1. It literally means God's own expressed thought. God called forth the human generations of all human history from the very beginning, according to Isaiah 41.4. 1 Peter 1.20 states that Christ was foreknown before the creation of the world. The Greek word prognosko for foreknown literally means to know beforehand. So Christ was known before the creation of the world. It is impossible for someone to actually exist as the Christ before being foreknown before the creation of the world. The same Greek word prognosko is used in Romans chapter 8 verses 28-29 which says that we, God's elect, were foreknown before the world was created. So, God's elect were foreknown before the creation of the world. So likewise, Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, was foreknown before the creation of the world in God's expressed thought in His Logos, which literally means the expressed thought of someone. Hence, all things about the Son of God were already foreknown by God in His expressed thought before the beginning of human time. This is why the Apostle John was led by the Spirit to use the Greek word logos in John 1.1 1, 1, rather than Son in John 1.1. 1, 1. The text does not say, in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was God. It says, in the beginning was the Word, the expressed thought of the only true God the Father, who was with himself. In this light we know that God prophetically spoke to the Son, saying, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness of the majesty of your kingdom, before the world was actually created, and long before God the Father would eventually speak these words to the Son, when the Son would be exalted to sit on the throne of God, the throne of Yahweh. The context of Hebrews 1, 8 and 9 is a messianic prophecy taken from Psalm chapter 45, 6 and 7, which says that the Messiah would be called God in the prophetic future, while also having a God in the prophetic future. For the scriptures affirm that the Son of God would be exalted to sit on the throne of God, which is called the throne of God and of the Lamb in Revelation 22, 3, which inspired scripture reveals is the throne of David. 1 Chronicles 29.23 says that the throne of David is called the throne of Yahweh. Psalm 45, 6, and 7 and Hebrews 1, 8, and 9 could not be addressing an alleged pre-incarnate God the Son because the text says your God has anointed you. Past tense. Your God has anointed you. God as God cannot be a pre-incarnate anointed God person. For he who anoints is greater than he who is anointed. If a pre-incarnate God the Son had a God and was anointed by his God before the incarnation, then we would have an Aryan Jehovah's Witness type son like a created angel rather than a Trinitarian son. 
Wherefore, Jesus, as a child born and as the Son given, was already called God in God's Lagos, in his express thought, before his virgin conception and birth actually began. The human child born and son given can also be called God because he was the reproduced copy of the Father's being as a fully complete human being, according to Hebrews 1.3. He is the express image of the Father's person as a human person. This explains why Jesus, as the express thought of God, was already addressed as God when God said, Your throne, O God, in Psalm 45, 6, and 7, which is cited in Hebrews 1, 8, and 9. For God as God is the only true God the Father. But that God also became a true man in the Incarnation through the Hebrew Virgin, who would be called God with us in the prophetic future. The second reason is that God's Word is God, just as God is called light and God is called love in the New Testament. 1 John 1 5 states that God is light, and in Him is no darkness. This is the same thing as saying that the Word was God in John 1 1. God's Word is the express thought of Himself as an aspect or attribute of Himself, just like God is light expresses the fact that light is an aspect or attribute of God himself. Daniel 2.22 states that God knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. It would be completely ridiculous for anyone to suggest that God is light in John 1.5 proves that the light of God is another distinct divine person beside God himself. In like manner, no reasonable person should suggest that God's light dwells with God in Daniel 2.22 and God is light in 1 John 1.5 proves that the light of God is another distinct divine person beside God himself. In like manner, no reasonable person can affirm that the word of God in John chapter 1.1 proves that the word of with God is a distinct God, the Word person, as a distinct divine person beside himself. In like manner, 1 John 4, 8 says, Whosoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. The text says, God is love. So God is love and God is light, just as God was the Word in John 1, 1. God's Word is living, according to Hebrews 4.12. And God's Word is spirit and life, according to the words of Jesus in John 6.63. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Therefore, God's Word, the Logos, is an aspect or an attribute of God himself, just like God is light and God is love in 1 John. Trinitarians depend upon a great deal of imaginative eisegesis in their conception of an alleged God the Word person in John 1 1 as there is no substantive evidence to show that the Word of God the expressed thought of God is another distinct divine person beside God himself because the Greek word logos does not mean another person it means the expressed thought of a person Moreover, the word that was with God is translated from the Greek word logos, which literally means the express thought of a single person. The Greek word logos has everything to do with the express thought of a person, but nothing to do with actually being a person. Hence, to say that the logos of God is another co-equal God person who was always with God the Father, is the same thing as saying that a distinct God, the express thought person, is with another distinct God person. If this was the case, then God the Father would have no logos, or no express thought of his own, because the Son would be a God the logos, or a God the express thought person. Such an assumption is utterly ridiculous, as God's thought cannot be another distinct God person beside himself. Because if the Son is God, the expressed thought person, 
then where is the expressed thought of the Father? <laughs> that means the Father will not have his own expressed thought because the Son is the expressed thought person number two, God person number two, which is completely ridiculous because the Hebraic meaning of the Greek word logos in the context of the Apostle John being a Jew would mean that the express thought is the express thought of the only true God, the Father himself, rather than some strange philosophical meaning of another God, the thought person beside the Father. Thayer's Greek lexicon states that logos means, and I'm quoting from Thayer, Thayer's lexicon, those things which are put together in thought as of those which having been thought, i.e., gathered together in the mind, are expressed in words. Accordingly, a twofold use of the term is to be distinguished, one which relates to speaking and one which relates to thinking. Therefore, just as a man has his own expressed thought, he thinks first, and then he expresses those thoughts in words, so our Heavenly Father has his own expressed thought, his own expressed logos. So logos, in and of itself, does not mean a distinct person. It means the expressed thought of a specific person. When Trinitarians affirm that there was always a timeless God, the word person, or a timeless God, the expressed thought person, they are really saying that God's expressed thought is another distinct person beside himself. However, the Greek word logos never means a distinct person anywhere in the Greek New Testament. God's expressed thought, his logos, can also be called God by the definition of the word logos because the invisible God's expressed thoughts are spiritual and they are living. Hebrews 4.12 states that God's word is living, and John 6.63 says that the words of God are spirit and they are life. So unlike a man's words, the words of God, they are spirit, they are living, and they are life. So we can say that God was the word, or the word was with God, and the word was God, in the sense of being an attribute or an aspect of who God is, but also, the word that was with God can also be called the expressed thought of God as Jesus was already called God by the Father from the very beginning. Psalm 45 clearly states that God the Father spoke to the Son before the creation of the world when he said, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness of the majesty of your kingdom. And then the text goes on to state, in Psalm 45, 6 and 7, that your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. So, in a sense, Jesus is the express logos, the express thought of God, in John 1, 1, who was already called God, according to Psalm 45, 6 and 7, and Hebrews 1, 8 and 9, from before the creation of the world, according to 1 Peter 1, 20, states that all things which were foreknown about the Son were foreknown, according to 1 Peter 1, 20, before the creation of the world. So God was able to speak to his son before the creation of the world as if the son already existed. Because Jesus is called the lamb slain from the creation of the world in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 and so many other texts. They speak of Jesus as already being foreknown before the creation of the world. Ephesians 1 4 says we were chosen, God's elect were chosen in him, in Christ, before the creation of the world. So all things that were known about Christ and about God's elect were foreknown by God before the creation of the world. The Apostle John clarified what he meant in John 1.1 1, 1, by affirming that the word, the Logos, was that which was from the beginning in John 1.1 1, 1, rather than a he who was from the beginning. So... John, who wrote in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, or God was the Word, he clarified what he meant in 1 John 1.1 1, 1, when he opened his epistle by stating that which was from the beginning, referencing the Logos in John 1.1. 1, 1. Because the Greek word for Word is Logos, which means the express 
thought of a person rather than being another distinct person. So the word was called a that. Jesus was called a that which was in the beginning in the mind and plan of God before the word was made flesh to become a personal son. For just as the express thought of a human being would be called a that rather than a he, so God the Father's express thought about his own foreknown son was an impersonal that before becoming a person when the word was made flesh in John chapter 1 verse 14. If you were to go to someone's funeral, no one normally says that was a good person. That was someone who lived a good life. They would say he was a good person, or she was a good person, or she or he lived a good life. You don't say that. You say he or she. In fact, people don't normally go around saying that people are that's. We say he or she. Now think about it. Even in common English speaking, or in any language of the world, nobody goes around saying that as a he or that as a she. It's always a he or a she rather than a that. Only thoughts can be called a that. Or impersonal things are called that. But you don't call a person a that unless the person was foreknown by God as a that which was from the beginning rather than a he who was from the beginning. This fits perfectly with 1 Peter 1.20 which says that the Son was foreknown by God or known beforehand by God from the very beginning. So what we're saying here is that the Son is the man who was born at Bethlehem because God became a man as God with us. So the human aspect of his existence had a beginning by his begetting. You're my Son, this day have I begotten you, Psalm 2-7. The Son was born at a specific point in time, and John 5-26 says, that the Father granted a life to the Son in Himself. So the Father was never granted a life, because the Father has always been the only true God, but God granted the Son a life in Himself, because when God became a man through the Hebrew virgin, the human aspect of His existence was granted a life, which allowed Him to pray, and allowed Him to be tempted, and allowed him to grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men, like all human beings must grow in wisdom and intellect before God. If the Word, the Logos of God, was always a distinct person before the Word was made flesh, why then was the Word called a that? For no one calls a living person a that. Only an impersonal thing or thought can be called a that. Therefore the foreknown Son of God was called a that which was from the beginning, in the mind and plan of God the Father, before the Word, the express thought of the Father, was made flesh via His virgin conception. Why do so many people believe that the Word of God in John 1.1, 1, 1, which literally means the express thought of God, is another distinct divine person beside God the Father? But well, one reason is that there are many poor translations which have been corrupted through church history. Scholar Bart D. Ehrman exposed Trinitarian influence in Bible translations when he said, and I quote, Erasmus, who produced the first Greek New Testament without the Trinity in 1516, was forced by the priests to put the Trinity in a new edition that was later translated into the King James Version of the Bible. End quote. William Tyndale was the first Greek scholar to translate Erasmus's Greek text into English in the 16th century. Tyndale had originally translated 1 John 1, 2, and 3 as it was in the beginning with God, but later Trinitarian influence caused the King James Version to read, He was in the beginning with God. Trinitarian translations have incorrectly supposed that the Word of God in John 1.1 1, 1 is another distinct divine person beside God Himself. That is why they translated John 1, 2, and 3 as He was in the beginning with God, rather than this or it was in the beginning with God. 
For the word he has been incorrectly translated in John 1, 2, and 3 from the Greek words hotos and autos, which are normally translated as this or it throughout the Greek New Testament. Thus the text should read, this or it was in the beginning with God, all things came into being through this or it, and apart from this or it, nothing came into being that has come into being. The Greek words hotos and autos function the same as the English words this or it. Like the English words this or it, they can refer to either an inanimate object or to a person. The context in which these words are used in Greek grammar will determine if the words should refer to a person or to an inanimate object. Since there is nothing in the text of John 1, 1-3 to prove that the Logos of God is another distinct God the Son person beside God himself, the text should be translated as this or it was in the beginning with God rather than he was in the beginning with God. God's word is his own expressed thought which proceeds out of his own mouth. The Greek word logos is used more than 300 times in the Greek New Testament. The same word logos is also used for the words of a man as well as the words of God. For example, Mark 5, 35-36 states that Jesus heard the word, the Logos, which was spoken by the messengers from the ruler of the synagogue's house, who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? The context proves Jesus. And Matthew 24, 46 states that no one was able to speak a word, a Logos, against Jesus. Furthermore, the word logos is used in many other passages of scripture which clearly prove that the word logos refers to God's logical plan and purpose rather than to a person. For example, Matthew 13, 18 and 19 states, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word, the text uses the Greek word logos for word. When anyone hears the logos of the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path." End quote. The original Greek word for word was translated from the Greek word logos in this passage of scripture. The same Greek word logos is also used in John 1.1. 1, 1. Could anyone say that the word, the logos of the kingdom, the expressed thought of God's kingdom is another person beside God himself? Obviously not. In fact, the Greek word logos is where we get our English word logic from. So the Greek word logos means the reasoning, the logic, or the thought of God which includes his expressed purpose and plan of the kingdom, as demonstrated by the fact that people might not understand it. In like manner, Paul wrote that the heretical word, the Greek text uses logos. The heretical logos of Hymenaeus and Philetus would spread like gangrene. In 2 Timothy 2.17, could the word, the expressed thought, the logos of these two false teachers have become another distinct person beside themselves? If not, then the word, the logos of the only true God, could not be a distinct person beside himself. Cross in John 1.1 1, 1 does not mean face-to-face -face as some Trinitarian scholars have falsely alleged. Some Trinitarians err by alleging that pros, meaning with, being linked to the word logos in John 1.1, 1, 1, means that the word of God was face-to-face -face with God. This is ridiculous. Dr. Luganville, a Trinitarian Greek scholar, commented on the face-to-face -face argument commonly used by Trinitarians in his online blog saying, and I quote, I don't much like face to face because it is so anthropomorphic and because John could have easily said pros upon pros pros upon, which would literally mean face to face, had he wanted to. It is a very common New Testament usage. After all, we too, who are most definitely not divine, will see him face to face Pros upon, pros, pros upon, in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. 
Paul used the Greek words pros upon pros, pros upon in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, which literally means face to face. If the words face to face is what God wanted to convey in the divine revelation, then why did he not use these Greek words? The Greek word logos, translated as word, is the source of our English word logic. Logos literally means reasoning, logic, thought, or speech. How could God the Father be face to face with logic or speech as another God person? That sounds utterly ridiculous. If the Word of God was a pre-existent Son person, then why did not the divine revelation just say, in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was God? But it does not say this. The clear meaning of the original Greek text in John 1.1 1, 1 proves that the logic, thought, or speech of God pertains to God the Father, proston theon, just as proston theon is translated as pertaining to or relating to God in Hebrews 5.1. So, God's express thought or logic pertains to God the Father himself just as a man's own logic, thought, or speech pertains to himself. Because the Greek word logos is used throughout Scripture for the express thought or the express logic of man, as well as for God. Therefore, the word logos, express thought, was with God from the beginning, was also called God, because God would also become a true man through the virgin. For in God's express thought, Jesus was already born, Jesus was already slain before the creation of the world, before he would actually be born and slain. Because in the mind of God, God calls the things which be not as though they already were. So Jesus was already born, the firstborn of all creation, the beginning of the creation of God, Revelation 3.14, and that express thought was later made flesh to become the living, breathing Messiah who was granted a life by his Father in John chapter 5, verse 26. Moreover, God's word, his express thought, is living, Hebrews 4.12. His express word is spirit and life, according to Jesus in John 6.63. 6, because God's express thought is an attribute of himself, just as 1 John says that God is love and God is light. For just as God's love and God's light are not literally distinct, co-equal God persons beside himself, so God can be called the Word without that Word literally being a distinct, co-equal divine God person beside himself. For more videos like this one, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit us on the web at apostolicchristianfaith.com. Lord bless.